Now, this morning will probably be a little more teaching than preaching. I say that, and then we'll see what happens. But I, I'm going to speak to everybody in this room, but I'm especially going to be speaking to the men in this room. So, ladies, please indulge me this morning, if you would. does not mean that this does not apply to you, uh, but I'm going to deal and speak specifically to men in this room fathers, those that will be fathers, and grandfathers. And I'm going to give you a charge today. And I, I'm hoping that when we leave here today, that we will understand very clearly what our role is when it comes to being biblical fathers. Now, as we get ready to begin this morning, I, I want to make this statement. A father is more than just been present. And I think we have to understand that. So I, I want us to just keep that in our mind today. And if the Lord would help me, I, I'm going to deal with rescuing a generation. How many knows our world's in a mess? But instead of focusing on the world, let's just focus on our nation this morning. How many knows our nation's in a mess? And I'm going to give you some statistics that's going to validate what I'm saying. But I don't want it, what I'm getting ready to say to be taken out of context either. And I want to make this statement. This, the statistics is painted with a broad brush concerning our nation and it's statistics that have, you can look and they come from many different places. But, and I understand that every family unit is unique and different. But even for those that have been raised in single parent homes, please hear me, no matter what led to that decision, we're not casting doom and gloom on that situation. But I'm saying that where there is not a father present, you and I as men of faith have a responsibility to make sure that those children that do not have that father in their home has the same opportunity that those that do. We have a spiritual responsibility as fathers. So I want us to keep those things in mind. In Luke chapter number 15, I'm going to pick up this story in verse number 17 to read uh, just to lay a foundation. And you say, why is it so important to address and deal with fathers? Is because Paul made a statement to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. I believe it's verse 15. He simply said this. He said, though we have 10,000 instructors that we have not many fathers. It's one thing to instruct. It's another thing to father. It's one thing to teach. It's another thing to train. But so we pick up this in Luke chapter number 15. We know that, let me give you a backstory real quickly. The gentleman has two sons. The younger of them has asked his father, said, will you let me have what comes to me? We know that he took it. It says not many days after that, he left. He went into a foreign land. He wasted everything that he had with riotous living is what your Bible says. But then in verse number 17, it says, and when he came to himself, talking about the younger son, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have, fathers have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. So he arose and he came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy side, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and get this, and they began to be merry. 
for a few moments today, I want to talk to us for a subject today of the role of a biblical father as we talk about rescuing a generation. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the men and women of God in this room and those that are joining us by way of internet today. I pray over the next few moments that you would anoint me to deliver that which you've given me. And Lord, I pray that we would have ears to hear, hearts to receive, as well as a will to respond. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Thank you for honoring the word of the Lord this morning. Today as we focus on the role of a biblical father, allow me to say this to every one of us, men and women alike this morning, Psalms 37 and 27, or 23 rather, tells us the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. I want to ask us the question this morning, especially men, did you allow the Lord to guide your steps this week? Did you allow them to guide your steps when it come to the leading of your family? We look at the current situation in our nation today and along with others, we quickly realize that the current trend that we're on cannot continue. We are witnessing children of all ages be overran by darkness and hopelessness and a large portion of this darkness that we are dealing with today is simply birth due to the absence of fathers. We could not ignore the effects that we are witnessing due to the absence of fathers. We are witnessing what it is to experience a nation that is unprotected. Now, which leads me to the place where we cannot overstate the importance of what it is for men, godly men, to become willing to step up and to fill the role that has been abandoned by so many. Over 18 million children in America today are fatherless. Please hear me. This is truly one of the most urgent needs in our society today. Out of Americans that was polled, 72% of people in the United States of America believe that the most significant problem facing us today is that of fatherlessness, 72%. I'm inclined to agree. What is a father? I'm sorry to offend the, not really sorry, the crazy gender movement But the definition that you will find in Webster or any other dictionary is this. It is a man in relation to his child or children. A man. Can I say that? A a man. But also it's not just a man, but it is a man who gives care and protection to children or to others. So the absence of fathers has truly become the most deadly, and I don't use this word lightly, has has become the most deadly pandemic to ever hit America in its history. Let me give you the definition of a pandemic. It is this, it is a widespread occurrence of an infectious disease over a whole country or a world at a particular time. You could not go to any place in the United States of America right now and escape this issue of fatherlessness. It's everywhere. It's through every demographic. And I want you to understand we are currently witnessing the absence of father across this nation in record number and it's increasing every day. A few statistics concerning this pandemic just so that you can draw a picture in your mind with me this morning. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. 85% of all children that exhibit behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. 80% of rapists comes from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 75% of all adolescent patients in chemical abuse centers today in America comes from fatherless homes. 85% of all youth sitting in prison today grew up in a fatherless home. If we translate these statistics, it means the following. 
Those raised in fatherless homes are this, five times more likely to commit suicide, 32 times more likely to run away, 20% more likely to have behavior disorders. Boys are 14 times more likely to commit rape, nine times more likely to drop out of school, 10 times more likely to abuse chemical substance, nine times more likely to end up in a state-operated institution, and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. It can be said in this manner, as fatherhood goes, so society goes. Men, please hear me, your role is important. We must awaken and do our part to turn the hearts of the fathers towards the children and the children to their fathers. Malachi chapter 4 and 6 makes that very clear. As I began to research through this crisis or this pandemic, I quickly realized the need to sound the alarm this morning. And you say, oh, but Father's Day is supposed to be a time of celebration, and yes, it is. But at the same time, you and I must understand we could not afford to bury our head in the sand this morning because we have a generation that is experiencing this pandemic, and if something doesn't change quickly, God help us and God help our nation. May I say to everyone in this room today, just because you're in the room, men, doesn't mean you're present. We need dads and moms both to understand the responsibility of guiding their children. Allow me to share a few steps with us today to accomplish this task because can I tell you, it is something that cannot be ignored. I have a dear friend that's in heaven now and he was, had the privilege of going in to a lot of places around the globe but he also had the privilege of going into some of the most maximum secure prisons in this nation and he was taken to death row and he began to, he w- walked in and as Pastor Rick went in, they released him into a yard with about 200 men that was waiting just for their day of death and been overwhelmed. He began to sit and talk with them and spent the afternoon with them. And his conversation began to be this, tell me about your dad. And all of a sudden they began to laugh and they said, what do you mean? Tell us about our dad. If we had had a dad, if we'd had a father, we would not be here today talking to you. They understood the significance of the role that you and I possess as men this morning. We as men must take the responsibility. The first thing I would say to every man in here, it is, the, it is important that you and I understand that we must take the responsibility of becoming our child's first teacher. Teach them daily tasks, absolutely, as well as respect, as well as to walk with Christ. Proverbs 22 and 6 tells us, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. To train simply means this, to develop or to make proficient through instruction and discipline. Can I tell you, just because you're sitting in the room does not mean you're training your child. It's okay, I'm not looking for amens this morning, and I'm not looking for anyone to shout me down. But I'm here to tell you today, You can look at your screen time on your phone and it will probably say that you had an average of three to four hours a day on this thing, but yet you probably didn't speak to your children five minutes. God forgive us because you're living in a false reality. Doesn't matter how much you like somebody's post. I'm not against liking it, but I'm gonna tell you something. Those people are not what's going to get you to the place that you need to be. And they are not going to be the ones that raise your children. But while you're spending three and four hours on this thing, also you have allowed your children with no restrictions at all to be mentored and trained by those that are putting it on there. And can I tell you that we have the leader of Instagram even this week made a statement in her interview bragging about how much uh, and how well their agorism are uh, in, uh, when they begin to look at your, they said your feed is going to look specifically just like it needs to look for you. We are so committed to that that you're not going to see what I see because I know what you what you like but the problem with that is this it is not going checked it's going to, and you find out that Instagram now is that's where a lot of our kids live Instagram is the number one place for pedophiles 
but yet we have no restrictions, but then at the same time, we will let this lead and train our children for four hours a day, six hours a day, five hours a day, but we're too busy. I'm not, I'm not teaching this morning from an anger place, but I'm teaching from a weighty place this morning. And I'd like to be teaching and preaching something differently, but I have to do what God has placed in my heart to do because I'm gonna tell you something. There's a generation dying and going to hell while we sit in the house of God lifting our hands and saying, oh, we love Jesus. Notice Paul's statement when he was speaking to a grown Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 15. He said, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scripture, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. What Paul was acknowledging is this, is Timothy, I understand that your mama and your grandma had faith, but also I'm acknowledging that somebody invested in you. Because he says, from a child thou hast known the holy scripture. I want to ask the question, men, how much of God's word have you instilled in your children. It isn't just mama's responsibility. Secondly, this morning, please hear me. We as men need to exemplify a godly life. Meaning this, we should not walk around with blurred lines of what's right and what's wrong. I was sharing with Jade this morning, God help us, the spiritual leaders in our nation I listened to one this week in an interview simply brag about the fact that he got angry and he, get, he was upset because things was going against him. And he said, I'm going to be completely transparent with you. Is that okay? And he brags from the platform in front of a few thousand people. And he simply says, I got so mad that I just cussed them out. Really? God help us. Your children are watching Paul, when he's writing to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, notice what he says. He says, you are an epistle, and you are known and read by all men. What does that mean? It means this. This passage teaches us that how we live our lives is important because our lives is a letter that has been written for the world to read. And can I tell you today, your children are the first one to read it. You see, your children doesn't just read what happens in here on Sunday, but they see how you behave on Monday through Saturday. They see how you treat your wife, and wives, they see how you treat your husbands, and, and, and they see the, 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 the attitude and the atmosphere is what they live in every day in your home, and it doesn't matter how many men or women you fool on Sunday morning, uh, but what matters is that you understand that children are watching you. Some of you are wishing you'd slip in this morning, I'm sorry. But we need to exemplify a godly life. Thirdly, is this this morning, we must also realize it's our responsibility to provide for our families. You say, oh, you're not going there. Oh, yes, I'm going there. First Timothy 5, 8 tells us this. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now, I'm not talking about just financially. That is a role. Yes, men, get up, go, to, go get a job and provide for your family. But this is talking about every area within the structure of family. It's talking about understanding that we make sure that our children are protected physically, emotionally, and spiritually, as well as that they develop physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Quit trying to take the easy road out and expect your wife to do all those things. I should have got an amen from the women right there, but that's all right. Everybody's got so sensitive. Don't you dare talk to my man that way. Well, get over it. It'll be all right. Because I'm going to tell you something. We become so soft 
that biblical correction is now considered to be an attack. And it's not an attack. It's called biblical instruction because the Lord loves uh, those that he loves. He chastens. And sometimes we need to be chastened. Proverbs 13 tells us this, that not only are we to make sure that we provide, but also we are to be men that bring discipline. Yo, you're not going there. Yes, I am, because Proverbs tells us this, 13, 24, he that spareth the rod hateth his son. If you never correct your children, do you know why your children love Miss Debbie so much? You ought to live with her. She has no problem bringing correction and discipline. But it's not out of anger. It's not out of anything of that nature. But it's like, listen, there's structure. Structure is discipline. And if you never discipline your child, you say, oh, but I want to be their best friend. Listen. No. Especially as men. Men, it's your responsibility to bring discipline to your children. Because discipline brings safety. Discipline in the mind of a child is interpreted as love. Hear me. The one who loves his child is very careful to discipline them. We're not talking about abusing a child. We're talking about rearing a child in a manner that is beneficial and is constructive and getting them to a place where they're walking in a safe zone. Listen, please hear me. This can only be done when we understand the significance and the importance of it. This can be called proactive leadership in your homes. Can I tell you, it's not enough for us to be always on defense and trying to fix something. If we would discipline, we probably wouldn't have to try to fix near as much as we try to fix if we'd been on the front end. Please hear me. It's not going to hurt little Johnny to tell him no. Because what's cute and accepted at two will cause him to sit in prison when he's 20. Because when he's two, everybody laughed. At 20, it's not a laughing matter. Fifthly, this morning, please hear me, we must spend time with our children. You heard me say just been in the room doesn't mean you're present. But notice, we're talking about being engaged with our children, men. Deuteronomy chapter 6, you say, is it really that important? Absolutely. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 through 9, notice what was given to the children of Israel. And these words which I command thee this day shall be on thy heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And thou shalt talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And also you'll bind them for a sign upon your hand, and thou shalt be the foreign lintels between your eyes, and you shall write them on the post of your house and on your gates. Meaning this. Godly instructions, just because they were presented, did not mean that that was enough to keep a generation in line. It meant somebody had to diligently teach it to them. How diligently, as men, are we taking the responsibility to take this word and to make it alive in the lives of our children and our grandchildren? Please hear me. It's one thing for them to come in this house and hear a message. It's another thing for them to be diligently instructed and taught by men on a day-to-day basis. We are also to be men of compassion. Please hear me. Psalms 103 and 13 tells us, Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. A real father will have compassion towards his children. We must be aware of the struggles that presents themselves to them. And sometimes, dads, please hear me, sometimes the greatest thing we can do is just be present with them. 
They don't expect us to have every answer to every situation. But they do expect us to be present and to talk and to take them to a place of God's word and find the answer together. And then, seventhly this morning is this, we cannot provoke our children. When you begin to read through the book of Ephesians, you find that Husband is to love his wife as Christ loves the church. and We understand all of that. But there's something that you begin to find when you read through that. We also find in verse numbers, chapter 6 and verse 4, it says, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up. I think those words are so important. Bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You notice it's not giving the mother the instructions to do that. But over the last 30 years in our nation, we have flipped the role and we have expected the women to take the children to the house of God. I'm grateful for every lady that takes that responsibility and does that. And I say thank you publicly today for doing so because somebody else not willing to step up and do what they're supposed to do. But the day has come where men have to do it. Because statistics show us that if a man will get up and take his children and his family to the house of the Lord, if he makes it a priority, 96% of the family goes to church. Where if it's the lady doing that, it's only like 30 some odd percent go to the house of God. Men, you have a responsibility today. We can't provoke them, but we have to bring them up. And we also must this, we must never give up on our children. Please hear me. In our text, we see the example of what a true biblical father is. He never gave up on his son and he refused to give up on hope concerning him. And he remained willing to receive him when he returned. In Luke chapter number 15, there's so many things you can talk about. But what I find in this story is so amazing is that while he was yet a great way off, he recognized him, meaning he had an anticipation. He had a hope that one day my son's returning. He never gave up on him. And I don't know where your children are today, your grandchildren are today, but listen, it is not your, it's not your role to give up. Men, we're not quitters. We have to proceed to believe and to walk in hope and say, you know what? God's word is forever established. And we find that in this story, while yes, we are to discipline them and we are to hold them accountable, but we must never give up on them. And I believe this morning that we find in this passage of scripture where this example gives us It simply says not only did he believe that one day his son would come, but he was making preparations for it. How do I know he was making preparations for it? Because when he turned to his servant, he said, I want you to go and I want you to get the best robe. I want you to get the ring and I want you to get your shoes. We've preached on all three of those. But there's also another thing that he said to his servant. And by the way, go get the fatted calf. He didn't say just go get a calf. He said, go get the fatted calf. What's that mean? It means that there was a calf in the stall that was been been prepared because he knew that one day my son's coming home. What he was simply saying is, I am never giving up on him. I don't know where he's at. I don't know what he's doing. I don't know what his condition is, but I know this, that because I have taught him and because I have trained him, I know that one day he will come home, and when he comes, we are not going to have to wait, but we are going to be prepared in the moment. And he turns to him, and he simply says, go get the fatted calf so that we can eat and be merry. But then the last line of that simply says that when they began to do that, that after they killed the fatted calf, it says that they did begin to eat and be merry. Can I tell you, there is joy when a father receives his children. 
That's, that's that young boy in our story tells us, well, I'm not worthy to be a son. I just want to be a servant. I have messed up so bad. The last thing they need is to be beaten down in shame and guilt. Uh, but what they need is a father to run and fall on their neck and kiss them and say, you know what? I understand the mistakes of yesterday, but yesterday is gone. Today is a new day. And today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that I'm going to love you. I'm going to care for you. And I'm going to position you to be all that you can be. That's the role of a father this morning. But let me give you another. We also must understand men. I understand that our personalities are different and I understand that maybe men are not as emotional as women and all of these types of things, but that does not give you the right to not pray for your children. And not just privately, but publicly. Paul concerning Timothy, who he viewed as a son, a spiritual son, he said, I know what happened to you because I was there when we laid hands on you and you received something. But also we find that David, when you look at his life, he was getting ready to the, come to the end of his life and he had wanted to build a temple for the Lord and the Lord said, you can't do it. But he prepared an abundance for it. And then you read in Second Chronicles chapter 29 uh, and you start in about verse 10, you'll read down where he begins to publicly, before all of the people began to pray and in the midst of his prayer, he finds this verse in number 19. And it says, and in the midst of his praying for his nation and praying for the building of the temple and and, and giving instructions, this is what he says. And as he's speaking to the Lord, he says, and give unto Solomon, my son, a perfect heart to keep thy commandments, thy testimonies, and thy statutes, and to do all these things which is to build in this palace for the which I have made provision. He was simply saying this, I need you to make sure that my son is covered. Can I tell you, there's something about the prayer of a father that covers a child. And we need a generation right now to experience that covering. You say, why is that so important? When our children know that we are lifting them up in prayer, they will develop a deep sense of love and security. Why is it that we see such a disarray in our nation amongst our young people today? And why is it that we see such disarray, especially in our young African-American males? It's because of the simple fact they have never experienced the deep love and security of a man in their life that was willing to lead them, guide them, direct them, and pray over them. Men, you can do this. But not only can you do this, we must do this. And ladies in this room, please hear me. You need to encourage your men to do it. Now that may mean you have to back off a few things. Don't get me started. Well, I want my man to do this, this, and this. And then you do this, this, and this, and then wonder why he doesn't do this, this, and this. Back off. Do it like this. Say, so you know what? If you don't do it, it ain't getting done. See what happens. You want me to continue? Our nation is in great, uh, great trouble right now. You say, is all of this really, really that significant? I'm going to tell you something. We are in a sick, sick world. Yes, we are. But as much as I love the United States of America, we are one of the most sickest nations, if not the sickest nation in the world right now. You say, how in the world can you say that about your homeland? Because it's true. Do you understand that right now while we're sitting in this house, that the number one source for child pornography and sexual activity with children. It is not Thailand, it's not anywhere else, but it is the United States of America. We are the biggest demand for child garbage. I'll say it that way. What do I mean by that? Our nation has become the number one source for child sex trade that is taking place in this very moment of time. And I'm gonna tell you something. 
It's happening by some of the most powerful and strongest leaders in our world, as well as even those within the church community. Our children are being preyed upon without much resistance at all due to the fact that there is an absence of fathers. If the fathers was present, the children would not be abandoned. We need right now an army of men to rise up that will begin to protect a generation. I'm not calling on the world, I'm calling on the church. The modern day slave trade is not based upon race, but it is based upon age. Every few moments a child has been abducted. Hear me. That child is, can be abducted in Chicago, it can be abducted in Indiana, it can be uh, in Denver, wherever. It doesn't matter in this nation. Within 24 hours, it will be out of the country. Sometimes it will be brought out of the country, then brought back into the country in a different manner. But there is great movement. And these children, every few moments, are being taken, and this is the tragedy of it. They are used and abused and used and used multiple times every day because there was no fathers present. Human trafficking is one thing. Children trafficking is another. You hear me? Both are very devastating, but when you start looking at children, a child is supposed to have somebody to protect it. A child deserves the right to have a father and a mother present. Our children have been abducted every few moments and thrown into slavery while we simply sit and talk about how wonderful it is. If that isn't enough, can I tell you, when you start looking at statistics by the end of this year going into next year, child sex trade will surpass the drug cartels in volume and in money astronomically. I can only sell you a drug one time, but if I have a child, I can sell you that child multiple times, multiple times a day. But then unfortunately, when we deem that that child, for lack of not to be off color, but when we deem that child is not fresh enough anymore, we don't just throw that child and release it back into the world. But no, now we've got even another area of darkness because fatherlessness is so present. Is that as this, we then will take that child and we'll cut that child open and we'll take their organs and we'll sell them on the black market. It's documented. It's happening every day of our life. But we talk about revival. We talk about wanting a move of God. And we won't even protect the ones that can't protect themselves. God forgive us. A few years ago, there was a man by the name of Tim Billard. He worked for the United States government. He was trying to rescue a child. He receives a call. The operation is over, come home. He says, I can't come home. I know she's out there. Come home. The operation is shut down, come home. He picks up the phone and calls his wife and he says, I, I, I can't come home. Because there's a girl and she's out there. What am I supposed to do? Come home, keep my job, keep my comfort. What do I do? His response was this that he heard on the other line of the phone was this. Quit your job and don't come home until you bring her with you. Most people now call him a vigilante. But he is the founder and the operator of Operation Underground Railroad. It's taking place today. To date, they've rescued over 7,000 children. Amen. 
They're going into the darkest places of the world, working with people to rescue children every day. Is it important? Absolutely. Can I, can I tell you this? A lot of those children that's in those situations today, they're called to be pastors and teachers and leaders, voices for the church. But before they ever have a chance to develop the enemy stealing and taking everything from them. And we think it's not important to be fathers. I'm not calling you just to be a father to the one that you gave birth to, but I'm talking about you have a community around you that is fatherless. And if we don't step up, the enemy sure will. Don't tell me you're too busy. Don't tell me it's not your responsibility. Word of the Lord simply says this. I know what our culture says. Our culture says, do what makes you happy. Our culture says, do whatever makes you fulfilled. Our culture says, do whatever it is to make you feel successful. That's what our culture says. But the Bible says, take up your cross daily and follow me. What he's simply saying is, die every day to the cause. Our commission hasn't changed. We are to be a light. We are to be salt. We are to be those at rescue. We are to be ones that's present for the widow, and we are to be the one that's present for the fatherless. On this Father's Day, what does being a father really mean? I'm going to tell you something. Being a father is the thing that brings more fulfillment to my life than anything else. I love what I get to do. I love the places that I've got to be. But I would not trade anything for what I have with my son and my daughter and now with my grandbabies. And I understand that it's my first place of ministry. I continually try to encourage my son to be a man of God. I continually try to encourage my daughter to be a woman of God. And I continually try to teach my children my grandchildren to worship and to be pure in the sight of God. If I fail there, I failed. And when I look around and see a community that has no fathers and no mothers, and I look at a church that is filled with godly men and godly women, there's no reason for them to be fatherless or motherless. Because I know your heart I know you're wonderful people, but just having a wonderful heart and been wonderful people is not enough. People with a wonderful heart and been wonderful has to engage. And I'm giving you a charge today to let's make Connorsville, Indiana and the United States of America a place where fathers and mothers are present again. Because that's what's going to change the world. That's what's going to make a difference. Listen, my friend, it's a real fight today, but somebody must step up and provide the protection and the care and the love for a generation. As they come to the music this morning, there's so much more I could say, but I'd like for you to come back next week, so I better quit while I'm ahead. I mentioned Operation Underground Railroad. I encourage you to go online and learn a little bit about them. They're getting ready to release. I'm not a big movie person. I don't, I've not been in a cinema for years. I, I don't, it's just not my thing, but but July 4th, and actually on July 3rd, I think they may even play it on the 3rd here at our local cinema. But July 4th, there's a movie that's been released. It's called The Sound of Freedom. 
and it is going to cover the life of Tim Billard. Anybody ever watched the movie Passion of Christ by Mel Gibson? That gentleman, Jim Cavito or Cadizel, C- 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 however you say his last name, he's actually playing Tim's part. I've watched some interviews with these men over the last few days. And I've listened to some of the people that had the privilege to watch a pre-screening of this movie. And it will bring to life what I've preached to you this morning. It's based on true stories and true events that Tim and his team has done. There has to be an awareness made. They didn't just make a movie, but their, their whole goal is to start a movement to rescue these children. The ultimate goal is to have two million people in theaters come July 4th. They're well on their way. You can go online to Angel Studios and you can find, you can actually, they actually have free tickets if you're not able to afford a ticket. Or you can actually buy a ticket for ever how many you want and then buy a few extras so somebody can go that couldn't afford to go. You say, why are you promoting? And I don't think I'm necessarily promoting the movie. I'm promoting the story and the movement. Okay, so if you was to go see it, say, well, Pastor Ron promoted this movie and it, it's got smoking and drinking and it's got selling of drugs. And I'm not promoting that. They did a, they did a movie to get the message of the lifestyle of what's happening and it's real life. I'm not promoting anything foul, but please hear me. Sometimes we need to shake shake off our religious stuff and get in the real world and realize that this is a dark place. But there needs to be a sound of freedom begin to ring again, especially in the lives of these children. Debbie and I have given much of our adult life for children. Lord willing, I'll be getting on an airplane next week. And we'll be going back to Belize and working on the building, getting a training center, hopefully up and running real soon for children. But as well, we're going to be walking some grounds. I'm going to be walking five acres with Brother Derek. It's been offered to create a camp for children. It takes a lot of money. But the guy has hurt her heart and knows what we want to do with children. I don't have it, but God's got it. So I'm not just telling you something that we're not engaged in and wanting to do ourselves. we're going to rescue a generation the rest of my days ever how long they are I'm going to rescue a generation I'm going to develop a generation I'm going to train a generation and it sure would be easier if I had a whole group of men that was fathers and a whole group of ladies that was mothers and said you know what We refuse to be silent, but we will rescue. I wonder this morning, I wonder this morning, if there's anybody willing to go grab some calves and put them in a stall and say, let's begin to prepare because we're gonna be married real soon because we're gonna rescue some sons and daughters. good for us to be here today but it's going to even be better for us to be out there today I don't know how much edifying you're getting done today but I hope you're getting equipped and challenged today to 
understand that you and I have a great responsibility. You know, there's no other organization in the world that's been chosen for this outside of the church. But here's what I want to say to you. We have been led to believe, oh, you're chosen. Oh, God's chosen you. God's chosen you. You say, oh, that's, oh, I'm blessed. I'm favored. No, if you're chosen, that's not necessarily meaning you're favored or blessed. It means you've been given a great responsibility. And you'll be given an answer for that. So, yeah, we've been chosen for such a time as this. So how, how well are we doing with that responsibility that's been given to us? You know why we can rejoice in days ahead? It will be because we see sons and daughters not just sitting and nailing at an altar, but sitting in this house, lifting their hands, worshiping the King of kings and Lord of lords because somebody was willing to be the father and the mother. As we stand all over the house this morning, tell your neighbor this morning, say he does love us. I would tell them, but they probably wouldn't believe me, but they'll, they might believe you this morning. But I wonder if there's anybody in this room that would simply say, you know what, I want to rescue a generation. I'm willing to be a father, not just to my children, but to the children in my community and the children in this nation. There is an anointing that God gives to fathers to lead, guide, and direct, to love and to care, and to provide, to protect. I wonder today if we really are willing to embrace that. And I'm not talking to just the fathers and grandfathers, but even the men in this room that will step into fatherhood, and some of you sooner than others for sure. But I wonder, I wonder if there's any men in this room today that would be willing to step from your place of comfort and come and stand and join me in the front of this building today and say, the Lord can count on me to be a father. I wonder if there's any in this room. If that's you, I want you to come right now. Whether you're a father yet or not doesn't matter, but you say, you know what, I'm a man and I'm, I'll be a godly father. I'll take the responsibility seriously. Here's what I understand. If you get a group of men this size that would really come together, would lock arms. I look across this line, every one of you are gifted, every one of you are talented, every one of you possess skills that others don't. And I think what an army it could be. What an impact it can make. I hope you can feel the weight that I have this morning concerning this. Because it costs you something. You have to say no to other things to say yes to this. But if you'll say yes to this, the other things will take care of themselves. But I'm going to just... I just want to pray with you. And man, I just want you to lock arms. I'm going to ask you to hold hands. I'll just tell you to lock arms. That's more manly. I want you to lock arms. See, when you're locking arms like that, there's not a breach in this line. That means the enemy can't get through. If we could get a... If we could lock arms like this, 
began to resist the enemy and began to protect and care for a generation of children, we began to have a shout of joy and freedom. And you talk about not just having barbecue every now and then, we'd eat it continually, guys. We'd never turn our smokers off. But the question is, will we do what we can? Will we give everything that we have to make sure a generation experiences Jesus? Because he's the ultimate answer. To the women of God in this room, I'm going to ask you to help me right now. I'm going to ask you to stretch your hands towards these men. And I want you to begin to pray over them. And we're going to pray and believe God is going to give us wisdom, direction, and guidance so we would know how to rescue a generation. Dear Heavenly Father, right now, men, I want you to pray for the men on your right and on your left. Lord, today I pray. I pray for every man, every family. And Lord, today I pray. Lord, I pray for boldness. I pray for wisdom. Lord, I pray for the fresh impartation of the Holy Spirit to come to every man that's in the front of this room. Lord, I pray for a spiritual army to awaken and to arise. Lord, I pray this morning Lord, I pray this morning that there would just be an outpouring of the Spirit of God that would rest upon these men as they lead their families and, Lord, as they begin to be leaders in a community and in a nation. Lord, I pray that every evil thing that would try to exalt itself against them would be broken. And, Lord, I pray that there would be a greater passion and a greater zeal for the things of God and your word to arise a bit. And, Lord, I pray for health and strength to come to them physically and spiritually. But Lord, I pray that their minds would be renewed. I pray that their spirits would be revived. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would use them mightily for the building of the kingdom and for rescuing a generation. Lord, I speak uh, and I just call forth gifts and callings. Uh, Lord, I just pray forth uh, and I just call forth today, Lord, just a release uh, to come upon them for they could be the men of God that you've called them and ordained them to be for this hour and this season. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be rescuers of a generation. Lord, I pray for divine direction. Lord, I pray that there would just be an opening of our hearts to the fatherless. And Lord, I pray that we would see as you would see, that we'd feel as you feel, and that we would move as you move. And Lord, I pray that your will would be done in all of our lives. And Lord, I pray that as a corporate body of men, that there would be a sense of unity that would come and bring us together on a level that we've never known. Lord, I know that we love one another, but Lord, I'm praying that you would just begin to fabricate us together in a manner that would bring glory and honor to you. And Lord, help us to turn our city upside down by becoming engaged and involved. Help us to be the godly leaders that you're calling us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory. The church says, amen and amen.